Everybody that's uh, participating should be able to see uh, the home screen on my computer, and this is really where I wanted to uh, kick things off. I have a couple points before we get too deep into the program that I want to get across to you. First of all, um, I, I don't want you to feel by the end of this that I've just opened your mouth and jammed a fire hose in it and drowned you with information. There is no doubt an incredible uh, amount of information that we're going to share over the next couple hours and I by no means expect you to remember everything. However, I believe that each and every one of you, regardless of your abilities with Pico right now, can pick up a point or two that you can start practicing out in the shop and that's, that's really my goal. So the first thing I'm going to start off with, if you can look over towards the left of your screen, uh, at home, you'll notice that I have three different Pico software shortcuts. I have a shortcut to PicoScope 7, I have a shortcut to Pico Diagnostics, and I have a shortcut to PicoScope 6 Automotive. Now, this class is going to revolve mostly around the PicoScope 6 software, as it's the true and complete and active software that's on the market. However, uh, PicoScope has been working on the 7 software relatively, <laughs> they've been going after it pretty hard from what I can tell. And I have a piece of advice for you. I know that some of you, especially your more advanced Pico users, really haven't liked PicoScope 7. That's really really been the, the feedback that I've gotten, but I, I have to be honest with you, I've really started warming up to that now that they're putting more and more functionality into it. The scope is actually, the, excuse me, the software is actually turning out to be really dynamic and it can be very helpful, uh, especially to a new scope user. But here's what I want to show everyone. Anytime you save a waveform, for example, I have three saved waveforms right here. Anytime you save a waveform, you can open it in any form you want. For example, if I come to this one that says dynamic resistance, if I right click on that, it will give me the option to open it and I can choose whether I want to open it with PicoScope 7 or PicoScope 6. I'm going to go ahead and open that with PicoScope 7 because we are going to utilize this waveform a little bit later. So here's the PicoScope 7 opening up on your screen. I'm going to go ahead and move that off to the side for later use. But then I'm going to take that same waveform, and this is the point I wanted to get across to you. I'm going to take the same waveform, and now I'm going to open it with PicoScope 6. So what, what I'm getting across to you here, trying to get to you, is that if you have a saved waveform, you have the ability to simultaneously open it in PicoScope 6 and PicoScope 7. And what that's going to allow you to do is it's going to allow you to start practicing and playing with some of the differences between the two different softwares. And as you'll probably pick up by the end of the night, especially with tonight's uh, main topic being on math channels, PicoScope 7 has put some incredible wizardry into their math channels. And I believe that utilization of math channels in PicoScope 7 is far easier to navigate than it was in PicoScope 6. So even if you do nothing else, just practicing with math channels in PicoScope 7, getting the details of the actual equations, you can then import them into your PicoScope 6 and practice. And, and that's something you'll have to play with on your own, but I wanted to get that covered uh, before we started. So let's go ahead and move this one off to the side for now too, and we'll go ahead and uh, kick this program off and get into where, uh, where I really want to be. Okay, so as we open up our, our program, I do have some objectives to get through tonight. Uh, I want to make sure that we uh, cover the three different Pico, excuse me, the three different, uh, the, the uh, six different math channels are in Pico. There's uh, three different pieces to that, built in, library, and loaded. Uh, I'm going to get into how to build custom math channels. Uh, basic ones, and then I'll touch on some more advanced ones. As I mentioned before, we're going to do a little bit of PicoScope 7 play. But by the end of tonight, I'll be able to get through some uh, math graphs and apply those to some real-world diagnostics. And I think you guys are really going to get a kick out of that. That's really a lot of fun for me. Uh, I'm also going to try to squeeze in a little bit of not only math channel operation, but I'm going to take the math operations in conjunction with some other Pico options. Uh, for example, and I'll get this done early in the program, so we at least get through this part. But for example, when you're using some of the other Pico menuing like serial, uh, serial decoding or uh, reference waveforms, in some cases, utilizing math channels in conjunction with those can make things a little bit easier for you. And I'll try to get that through. And provided we have enough time, we'll uh, step into a little bit of reference waveforms at the end and uh, possibly the manipulation of those overlays utilizing math channels at that point to continue. So we'll go ahead and get started here. First of all, uh, uh, what are math channels? Well, math channels are really exactly what they say. 
a math channel is a channel that I can create, a custom channel on my lab scope to change the view of any patterns that I've collected, whether those patterns are live or I've stored them. But it allows me to manipulate them in ways we've never even seen before. Now, you'll notice down here I said we can pretty be, be pretty basic, like addition and subtraction and multiplication and division. We can graph things like duty cycle and frequency. We could even step that up and go to maybe engines or components or accessory RPMs. Um, there's lots of different things that we can do, and I, I'm not going to read all this to you. You guys can read on your own, but I did make a note at the bottom of this screen, and I think you really need to wrap your head around this. Guys, if it involves math, the only thing that's going to hold you back with this is your imagination. It truly is the only limiting factor, and you know, as I speak, and I can include Todd and Cliff both in this for sure, uh, being buddies of mine. Even today, being a, a PicoScope user for the decade plus that I've been using it now, I still find features that just blow me away. I, I come up with ideas, so it's really a never-ending uh, it's really a never-ending game. So the one note that I did put up here, I said, when you do this, we can view these crafts or these math channels in any one of the three standard views that Pico utilizes. That would be the scope view, the XY view, and the spectrum view. Uh, both the XY view and the spectrum view are really beyond the, the nature of this class. We're just going to uh, base this on the scope class. However, those of you who use XY or venture into the noisy world of spectrum, uh, math channels will also apply to that the same way. All right, so starting with our math channels here, I have on the screen for you, uh, I have a Pico 6 waveform opened up here, and I'm pointing out that I have a channel A and I have an inverted channel A. Now, the channel A that you're looking at right here, you'll notice I put some arrows and you'll, you'll see that channel A is represented by the values on the left-hand side of the screen right here, where my inverted channel A is represented by these numbers over here. The point I want to get at here is that you can view the math channels in any way that you've already viewed standard input channels. And you need to think about something. I can put on PicoScope 6, I can put up to eight individual waveforms on one screen. Guys, that means I could take one waveform, I could build seven math channels if I wanted, and plop it all on one screen. But this, guys, this is basically limitless. The reason it's limitless is because I could also take that and put it on individual scope screens that I'll show you in just a second here. Now, before we get too far, I do want to point out that as far as uh, uh, waveform manipulation, the standard manipulation procedures that you would use for your normal inputs, like this channel A, whether you're using your zoom features, your magnifying features, any of these features that you're used to using will also apply in the same manner to the math channel. Now, the math channel will also play by the scale and offsetting game. Now, with standard channels, like the standard channel A, you have access at the channel indicator, like the channel A that you see right here, or B, C, and D. These up here, you can go in and mess with the scale and offsetting. But many of you have probably noticed that at the bottom of your vertical value, there's also a colored box. Now, this is going to appear very, very small on most of your screens at home. But right down here, you'll see there's a box that says times 1.0. If I were to click on that box, it pops up with this availability to vertically scale and uh, vertically offset or move up and down that particular channel. But what you'll notice here, and this is the cool part, this being the same color as this channel indicator here, when I built my math channel and its value popped up on this side, it also has the same scaling and offset box. So I can click on this box and I can manipulate my math channel the same way that I manipulated my standard viewing. Now it would give me my vertical scaling, my vertical offsets, and for those of you who haven't played with these buttons, these are simply uh, move to back, move to forward as far as the orientation on the screen. Now, I'm not putting this up here to confuse you guys, and some of you might giggle at what you're looking at on the screen, because this is actually, look, let, let's be honest about this. If you're using this crap to fix cars, you're in the, you're in the wrong industry. I mean, this is, this is insane to me. But what, I, what, I, what I'm trying to show you is I've got literally eight channels, guys, on one scope view. I've opened up nine scope views on this screen. And if you're looking at this, you'd realize that each one of these scope screens looks a little different. Guys, I've got eight standard input channels 
on some of the screens, I've removed channels and added math channels. I've got different zoom values on these. Every one of these has a different view, yet they were all the same. And if you want to get freakier and play with a thing called viewpoints that Pico gave us, I could literally take, if I was hooked to a car right now, I could literally take any one of these screens and I could start it running live with the others sitting in the position they're in. So when I say it's limitless and imagination's limitless, that's really what I'm trying to get across to you. So math channel location. Moving on to math channel location, both Pico 6 and Pico 7 keep them in different locations. What I'm showing on the screen right here is an example of Pico Scope 6. Moving down the Pico Scope 6 activity bar at the top, you can come to a column called Tools. If I click on Tools, it opens up a menu that gives me custom probes, math channels, reference waveforms, serial decoding alarms, on and on. You can read this. I will tell you right now, guys, I'm going to touch on serial decoding. Uh, I'm certainly not going to go into it the level that you need to understand it, but I want to show you how we can mix that with math channels. But as far as true serial decoding and alarms and masks and the other functions we have, we're going to have classes coming down the road that will dive into it with the depth that we're doing tonight on math channels. But if I come down here and I go into math channels and I click on that, in PicoScope 6, it gives me a list of built-in math channels that I can choose. It gives me a library and it gives me loaded. You should understand all of these by the end of the evening tonight. So before I get into Pico 6, I'm going to show you the location now in uh, PicoScope 7. So I'm going to pull over a PicoScope 7 here. And uh, well, I'll make this live because this is actually hooked. Uh, this is actually hooked, guys, to a, uh, a signal generator. So what you're looking at on your screen right here is a live PicoScope 7 with a uh, crankshaft position sensor on the top, a camshaft sensor on the bottom. I'm gonna go ahead and pause this screen for a minute and show you the math channel locations. Now, if you were listening to me in the beginning of this class, I told you guys, or I recommended, that you download PicoScope 7 and PicoScope 6 and learn to play with both of them because the functionality is different. I, I, I got to be honest with you. The functionality for math channels that Pico has been working on, as I mentioned earlier, has really gotten powerful in this platform. So in order to find math channels in the PicoScope 7, if you come down to the left-hand side, you see it right here, there's an icon for math channels. If I click on math channels, it will open up what we call the math channel wizard. Now, I'm not going to play too much with the PicoScope 7 Math Channel Wizard in this presentation, but I'm going to play with the Math Channel Wizard in PicoScope 6. I am here to tell you for sure it is far easier to build math equations in 7 than it was 6. Some of the reason for that is they utilize training wheels. I'll go ahead and show you the training wheels right now. For example, let's say I came down here and I clicked on scientific functions. There's a lot of stuff in here that Hey, hey, once again, guys, if, if you understand a lot of this stuff, you're probably in the wrong industry. I don't use any of this, but there is quite a few things I use, like negative duty cycle and positive duty cycle and frequency and advance and delay. These are all very, very common uses. Or maybe I want to come down into this wizard and it has one called automotive. Now, if I click on the automotive tab as just an example, you will notice there's a box that just says crank. Well, I'm going to go ahead and click on the crank for a minute, and this is the wizard that if you haven't played with it on PicoScope 7, that's completely different than PicoScope 6. What it does is it actually tells you what to put in this equation box. That was probably one of the biggest struggles I ever had uh, utilizing math channels with Pico is not knowing how to build the equation, not knowing if I should use parentheses, not knowing where I should use a comma, not understanding. Well, in this case, it highlights, it basically says, gee, Adam, you want to do an automotive crank? Yeah. Then right here, put in your signal. Well, I'll just choose channel A as an example. So there's A. The comma is already there. So then I just highlight this and it says, how many teeth is your crankshaft position sensor? Now, this is actually pretty interesting, guys. And this is a big difference that I'm starting to notice with seven that was not in six. Usually when I was using PicoScope six, I had to count the number of teeth. Like if it was say 60 tooth minus two, I had to take that into my equation to make sure the RPM came out. PicoScope 7 is doing something else here. I, I, I'm going to admit I'm not completely familiar with it, but I know that this particular crankshaft position sensor has 60 teeth minus two. I know that it does. But instead of putting 59 in there, which 
just keep the math off to the side for now. I'm literally just going to put in 60 and uh, I'm going to see what happens. So I'm going to put in 60 and I'm going to hit next. It says, Adam, you want to look at crank channel A with a 60 tooth count. The unit you're looking for is RPM. Oh, all right. I hit next and it gives me a range and I hit finish. When I hit finish, another channel just opened up on my scope right here. And I suppose you guys can see it. This is literally measuring how many RPM my crankshaft position sensor is making. So without me having to come up with the multiplications and divisions and all the math, the Pico 7 wizard has showed me how easy it was to just put in the channel you want, you put in the tooth count, away you go. And then if I come over here and measure this, for example, you will see that it is running at, and I can get right on top of that, oh, pretty close, uh, it is running at 494.7 revolutions per minute. Now, if I wanted to verify that, check this out, I can bring my vertical cursor right to this point right here. So there's my vertical cursor. And I'll bring my second vertical cursor to this representing one revolution of the engine. And uh, guys, take a look at this. I'm not exactly on there, I'm a little bit off here, but according to my vertical cursors, my RPM was 492.3. My math channel called it 494. So if I took the old approach that I used in PicoScope 6 and eliminated one pulse or two pulses, the RPM doesn't figure. So I got to tell you guys, I'm pretty interested in this. I think it's going to help a lot of you users out. So we'll go ahead and move away from that for now. My point behind opening this so early in the program was uh, find your math channels right here. Play with it. Uh, I think you'll enjoy what you have with the menuing. So we'll just tug that guy off to the side and we'll, uh, we'll get back to, to where we were headed. All right. So back to PicoScope uh, 6. So the PicoScope 6 math channels has three different uh, libraries, if you want to look at it that way. We have a built-in, a true library, and a loaded. All right. Now, to go ahead and start talking about these, we'll start with the built-in section. A couple things to understand about built-in math channels. Now, built-in math channels in PicoScope 6 are going to be channels that cannot be edited. They can be duplicated, as I'll show you in a minute, but they can't be edited. But it's pretty basic. For example, if I click on this box and it says, you want to invert A, well, guys, come on, figure it out. Obviously, I want to invert A. So if I click on that box and I OK it, then as you see on my PicoScope 6 screen that's in front of you at your home, you'll see that I have taken channel A, which was a saturated fuel injector that was pulling to ground right here, holding to ground uh, the inductive kick. Nice pinnel closing, by the way, beyond where we're at. But we've got a nice injector pattern here. And because I asked for channel A to be inverted, my math channel that you see the values on the right-hand side right here is my inverted version of that. Now, uses, uses for this, uh, typically we'd use an invert to say, maybe we've got an inductive kick on say a coil or an injector or a solenoid, something like that. I may want to invert it so I can fit more things on the screen to where it's not going off the screen. Or maybe I've hooked my, say maybe I hooked my current probe up backwards. I mean, most of you guys realize, and I know this is hard to see because of the, the background I have, but most of you guys realize that if you're using a current probe, like the low amp probe I'm holding in front of you, it's directional in how you hook it up. So depending on which direction I hook it, it may have my signal come in upside down on the scope. So if I don't want to go down and change the orientation of my probe, I could simply invert the channel if it becomes an issue. So there you have that. All right, let's go next. So next one down. Now you'll notice on the built-in section, we have invert A and invert B. Those are the only choices. I will fix that in a few minutes. We then come down to basic math, A plus B, A minus B, A times B, and A divided by B. A plus B is going to give us the value of channel A plus channel B added together. Now, if you're sitting there thinking about this, it might be hard for you to think about a reason that you would want to take two channels of your lab scope, channel A and B, add them together for a third channel of an addition. 
but there are some common uses for it. There may be cases where you wanna add the voltage on one channel to the voltage on another channel, or maybe you were say taking waveforms of pressures and you wanna add one pressure to another pressure, um, et cetera, things like that, maybe currents, whatever it be. But I will tell you this, I truly believe that in the built-in section of these six different options we have, these are relatively limited capabilities. We really don't start exploring uh, the capabilities of math channels until we start modifying those or building customs. So at this point, I'll tell you, it's a little bit limitless, but great practice to play with. A little limited, excuse me. All right, so let's move on. A minus B. Man, look, if you guys are paying attention, it should be obvious to you that if A plus B took channel A plus channel B and gave me a value, then A minus B would be exactly the opposite. It would be A subtract B and then get the value. Now this one actually presents us with a couple extra features that most guys don't think about. Uh, maybe we want to use our lab scope to, uh, maybe we want to figure out voltage drop. And of course in your mind you might be going voltage drop, what? I don't usually use my lab scope for voltage drop. Well, a little bit later in this program, I'm gonna show you a fantastic tool that I use for what I call extended time parasitic draws. And we'll get to that and this function will come back up again. Uh, but I will tell you one of the best sources, or I should say one of the more common sources that I use A minus B, something that simple for, is uh, for utilizing the Pico serial decoding function. Now, I I'm warning you guys, I, I'm not trying to change the flow of this class. I'm not trying to super confuse you here, but there's no doubt in my mind that many of you sitting here watching this presentation have tried to utilize the serial decoding function on say a high-speed CAN C network, whether it be flexible data rate or not, but you tried to decode it using the serial decoding function, which you saw earlier was under the tools menu. And there's also no doubt in my mind because it happened to me that when I went in and tried to decode high-speed CAN C positive which I have on the top in blue, or high speed can see negative that I have on the bottom in red, that I would get undesirable results. I got results that were out of whack. They, they didn't seem correct. I, I had issues with it. Well, what I've realized is that if I apply a math channel like A minus B to this, now look what it's done. So high speed can see is going from about two and a half volts and when speaking goes up to about three and a half volts. So it makes these positive changes, plus that there being high speed can see positive, goes up about a volt. Now high speed can see negative will do just the opposite. It starts at about two and a half volts and goes down about a volt. But if you've ever studied a, 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 a network like high speed can see, they are actually looking at the differential and pressure. And what I mean by this is, now think, if one of them goes up a volt, at the same time one of them goes down a volt when they go into what we call dominant state, if one goes up a volt and one goes down a volt, if you add those two values together, you get two volts. So you could say, well, Adam, when high speed can see went up a volt and high can speed negative went down a volt, then the differential and pressure would be two volts. So what it winds up allowing me to do is it allows me to take these two channels and make one channel that is the math of the two channels added together. So I can see zero volts when no one's talking and the full differential and pressure uh, when that uh, differential happens. And like I said, I really wasn't trying to change this into this. I just wanted to show you guys, those of you who are practicing with serial decoding, try utilizing this function. And then instead of, now watch, instead of trying to decode all of these individual high-speed CANCs, these one, two, three, four, five, six, or three different modules I'm hooked to on this car, you can simplify it by taking one of the positives, one of the negatives, build a math channel. In this case, I subtracted H from F. I built my math channel. And then the only thing I decode is that math channel. And it's going to make it easier for you. And uh, like I said, this is a topic that's going to be coming up further down the road. And uh, I'm sure some of you guys will be excited for it when we get there. But for you more computer geeky guys, some of you really need to chew on this. See, some of the features in PicoScope, like this serial decoding, for example, if I decode this, which I decoded these, these messages here, I can then export them out of Pico 
into Microsoft Excel. Now, like I said, if you're a geeky kind of dude, you realize that anything you put in Microsoft Excel, now the world's really your oyster. So now you can take a waveform or a serial decoding or whatever you've got in your Pico, extract it out into just basically plot points in the, uh, into your Excel and world's your oyster. So that's a little bit advanced, uh, but I just wanted to show you that with the uh, subtraction portion of these channels. Anyway, let's move on. Uh, next one down, we have A times B. So if I were gonna use the built-in channel A times B, uh, I would use this for things like uh, calculating Ohm's law, or maybe I've taken a picture of voltage and amperage. So voltage on one channel, amperage on another. And I happen to know that if uh, I wanna use Ohm's law and I wanna figure out what the actual power in watts was of that circuit, I could simply take my voltage times my amps. Well, this will allow me to make that type of math, build a third channel on my screen and uh, you know, show us uh, that. And I don't know if you guys read this or not, whether you care, but you know, in my mind, I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an avid uh, user of Ohm's law these days. And you really have to be, uh, especially if you're gonna use lab scopes and current probes and that sort of thing with your electrical repairs. But one of the ways I remember in my mind the Ohm's law triangle, you know, where they have volts on the top and then amps and, and resistance and multiplication and division. I remember the simple little line of victory for volts over auto for amps and repair for R. So victory over auto repair gives you the V over A times R up to you. But there you go. Next one down, A divided by B. The A divided by B. A divided by B is going to once again be very useful in Ohm's law calculations. Now, if I've lost you or you think this is too much or if you're enjoying it, hey, I hope you're enjoying this, but I'm gonna tell you something. My students would agree with this. And of course, I think some of you will after you've seen some of the presentations I put on. But when, when, I, when I put a presentation on, there's always a couple key points that I think people need to take out. And, and one of my common statements is this, if you take nothing else out of this class, take this one thing with you. And I will tell you this, the one thing over everything else that I hope every one of you can start chewing on and really get a feel for is dynamic resistance value in ohms. I'm gonna show you that live here in a little bit, but that is my one thing that I, I truly request you all get out of this uh, over everything. All right, so let's move in. The building of custom math channels. Now, so here's the problem we've got. I just talked about the operation of built-in math channels. I talked about built-in inverts, A plus B, A minus B, A times B and A divided by B. But if you were paying attention, you realize that when I showed you that quick little uh, interpretation of uh, serial decoding, that I actually used uh, H minus F. Well, here's the thing. Your built-in channels cannot be edited. They cannot be changed. So when this button says, hey, it's invert A, it means invert A. That's it. This is invert B. Well, guys, what if I want to invert a different channel? What if I've taken four channels or eight channels of information and I want to invert something other than, say, B or A? I would have to go in and build a custom or what we call library math channel. Now, when we start to build these library math channels, and here's where I'll start to slow down a little bit for you. When we start to build library math channels, we have a few different ways of going about this. We can create our own from scratch. We can edit. Now, when I say edit, any math channel that is in the built-in section or the library can be edited at any time. I'm gonna show you how we edit them. We can duplicate any channel at any time. And we can import from other scope captures or on the internet. And when I say you can import math channels, guys, you do a little digging around on the internet, you can find lots of pre-built equations to help you out with this uh, from an import standpoint. But let's go ahead and just start out with something simple. Here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna do a duplication. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take from my built-in section, let's say that I have, a, uh, I have used my lab scope and I've, I wanna invert channel C. Well, channel C isn't on here. I have channel A, I have channel B. I need to invert C. When you choose in math channels, you have two choices. You can check the box. So if you put a check in the box, it, op it opens that math channel. 
But if you highlight the name, like you see I've done here, like invert A, you will notice on the right-hand side of the screen, another option popped up. So if I went from, we're fine here, all of a sudden by highlighting it, it gave me the option to duplicate it. The advantage of duplicating a channel is it will give you the equation already. So let's go ahead, let's go ahead and duplicate A. When I clicked on duplicate A, it slapped it right down here in my library. So in my library, I have an invert A number two. Now, what you really notice here is going from invert A highlighted with only a duplicate available. Now you'll see that it opened up edit, delete. We have all these options. Once again, I explained to you in the built-in portion of this, you cannot edit those, but you can duplicate them. So now that it's in my library, I highlight this and I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to edit it. So when I edit it, okay, so we're going to go in, we'll edit this in. It pops up on the first screen and says, Adam, you want to edit your invert A. Invert A has the equation of negative A. That's the equation for invert of A. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to change that to a C. So it's easy for me to not remember that it's a negative number or anything. I'm just going to come in and I'm going to change that to a C instead of the A. Now, for those of you who are using eight channels of your Picos, uh, if you take this uh, drop down menu, it'll add the next four channels on there. So they're all in there so you can continue. But I said, okay, I want to make it a negative C now. When we hit next, it says, well, what do you want to call it? Well, I don't want to leave it called invert A number two. So I can literally come into the name, rename it, call it invert C. At this point, I can choose a color for it. Uh, we can go from just a drop down menu of colors to, as you'll see earlier, a, a plethora of any color in the world you want. Uh, for now, I'm just going to leave it there and we'll move on. The next thing it says is, what do you want to call this? Well, because I am simply duplicating a channel and editing that channel to change it. Uh, it's usually best if you leave these alone. I'll show you how to manipulate these a little bit later. So we're just going to leave that. We're going to do nothing. We're just going to hit next. And at the end, it says, okay, here's what you've accomplished. The math channels process is complete. You are going to invert C. Your formula is a negative C. You chose dark blue as a color on and on. And then poof. When I'm done, you can now see that in my math channels, in my custom library, I now have an option to invert channel C. Now, what's nice about Pico is that when you update your Pico scope, it, this will stay in your library. This will stay in your library until you highlight it and delete it or whatever you want to do with it. So now I have an invert C. Any of the other channels, A through D on a four channel, or all the way A through H on your eight channel scopes, you can invert any of those at that time. So that's how you would build that. Awesome. Continuing on. All right, guys. What's wrong with this picture? Oh boy, I, I, I already know how, I, know, I already know what's happening. Here, here we've probably got a whole group of Pico users out there and they just wanna jump on the fact that I've got a snap-on tool on here or whatever they wanna do. Guys, that is not the point. I own this tool too and it does a lot of good stuff for me. But I wanna know what is truly wrong with this picture. And you guys can talk in chat if you want, but I'm just gonna throw it right out there to you. Look. I am obviously using my Vantage Pro here as an ohm meter, which would be the same as any other ohm meter I have in the shop. And I am measuring the resistance of this solenoid. Not that you should care, but it came off a of Toyota there. At any rate, I'm measuring the resistance of this solenoid and my ohm meter states that this solenoid, while not active, while in a static state is 43 ohms. It's 43 ohms. Okay, here's what's wrong with this picture. This test sucks, guys. Every one of you either has or will get burnt by this test. You know, I know that the manufacturers give you specs and ohms, specs and ohms, specs and ohms, but every one of you has got to realize that if I'm measuring the static resistance of this solenoid right now, it is telling me that, Adam, right now while I'm sitting here, I'm doing nothing, I'm not working, I measure 43 ohms. That's useless, man. It's useless because what happens when I take this and I plug it into the wiring harness and I turn it on in the vehicle? Is it possible that when current physically flows through not only this solenoid, but the whole circuit controlling it, that we could have a resistance issue that could cause that to change? Could it change our resistance value because our amperage changes? And the answer is obviously yes. Now, 
before you get your hair on fire, yeah, I get it. This is a useful tool in that. If it reads way too high, it's junk. If it reads way too low, it's junk. But in a case like this, if the spec is actually 43 ohms and my meter says 43 ohms, all it tells me is more testing's required. So why didn't we try testing it the correct way in the first place? So let's talk about that. Obviously, I wanna show you how I would do it with Pico. So what I wanna do now is we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna build another custom math channel, but we're gonna build a custom math channel now from scratch. So instead of duplicating and editing, we're really gonna build uh, one from scratch. So here's the deal. If you guys understand Ohm's law, you would realize that uh, victory over automotive repair or volts equals amps times resistance, or volts divided by amps equals resistance, those sorts of things. Well, why couldn't I use my lab scope, in this case Pico, to measure the voltage in the circuit, the current in the circuit while it's working, and by the way, the entire circuit on the car, that's all the connections, the wiring harness, everything. Why couldn't I measure the current with my current probe and the voltage, then simply ask my lab scope to do Ohm's law for me so I don't have to freaking remember it? So let's try that. I know that if I want to come up with resistance, and I've studied Ohm's law, if I want to come up with resistance, I need to take the voltage in the circuit, divide it by the amperage, and I'll get resistance. So I'm going to build uh, an equation that is A divided by B. Now, one of the reasons you wanna understand building a custom channel like I'm doing for you right now is because A has to be the volts, B has to be the amps. Well, guys, think about this. If you're using this scope, you've done this. What if you took the amps on channel D or you took the, the voltage on channel D and the amps were on A? You may find yourself having to build this equation at an instant, so you have to know which channel is what. But let's go ahead and start with A volts and B amps. So I'm gonna come over to my, uh, my math channel, and I'm gonna go ahead and start building one. I'm gonna put in channel A, I'm gonna use the division bar right here, and then I'm gonna put in B. Now I'm gonna step back a minute and show you something. Probably one of the most frustrating things uh, that I had to get over when learning custom math channels was this red X that pops up. Look, at least the math wizard is smart enough to say, look, if we don't understand or like the equation you built, they're not going to let you continue. And that's exactly what that circle with the X is. So when I went ahead to build my channel, I put an A, it already says, hey, we got a problem. And I put in division, we've got a problem. He's not going to let me continue until I finished an equation called A divided by B. Then the next button pops up, I grab it and I move on. Now, my advice to you, you guys are going to do what you want anyway. My advice, however, is this. When you get to this next screen, name the channel something you understand. For example, what I've done here is I said A volts, B amps, dynamic resistance. I chose the color black, but of course I could choose anything. Whoops. I could choose anything I wanted at that point in time. Anything at all. At any rate, continuing on. Nah, now here's where it gets kind of fun. It says, well, Adam, what do, you, uh, what do you wanna call this math you're building? Well, right now the long name is unknown, but I know that I want it to be ohms because I'm building an ohms math channel. So I'm gonna go ahead and type in ohms as my long name. But notice over here, the short name has a question mark in it. See, the short name, as you're gonna see later, is the name that will identify the channel on your lab scope on the vertical axis where the values are. I'll show you that in a minute. But I don't want it to be a question mark. I want it to say ohms, but I wanna make a really short example of ohms. So I wanna put the omega symbol or the ohm symbol in. Now, regardless of what uh, Windows platform you guys are using, doesn't matter what you're using, but regardless of your Windows platform, you can go into your search engine and you can type in the search for character map. So if you type in character map, you'll probably only get to CHA and it'll already pop up. The character map will pop up a menu for you so you can choose from literally thousands of different uh, icons or characters. Uh, it just so happens for you geeky dudes that U plus 2126 
like you're going to remember that. But at any rate, U plus 2126 is the ohm sign. But when I find the ohm sign, I can click it, copy it, put it in here. So I've selected it. I copy it. And then Pico allows me so simply just to go to the short name and paste it. So what I've done is I've said my long name is ohms. I've pasted in a short name called the omega symbol. So it's pasted in there. This next section right here. Um, you know, I, uh, I had a telephone call with a gentleman this morning, actually, about this from our, uh, our class that we did on Monday. The range selection of overriding the selection can be extremely useful. It can also misguide you. In the picture that I'm using on the screen, I said, well, with dynamic resistance, I like negative 5 to 100. And the reason I say that is if, if I'm doing dynamic resistance, most resistance values that I'm looking for on a car are going to be somewhere between 0 and 100 ohms. A lot of stuff is in that 1 ohm, 2 ohm, 5, 10, 20, 30. So I picked negative 5 to 100 as just a starting point. I will show you, however, later in this program where you're going to have to manipulate that. But I put it at negative 5 to 100. So let's continue. I'm finished. You have built A volts, B amps, dynamic resistance, a formula of A divided by B, a color of black, and you picked a range of negative five omega symbol to end at 100 omega symbol. All right, now, here's what it looks like now that it's in my library. Now, this is one of the reasons, guys, that I said make sure you name it something you'll recognize because now the name that I put is A volts, B amps, dynamic resistance, and that will be in here until I edit it, delete it, whatever it be. Now, what I'd like to do for you now is show you some of the results you might get. And I'm gonna make this kind of live, uh, kind of live for you at this point. Um, so here's what we're gonna do. This is actually the results of me doing this exact test on that solenoid that you saw a few pictures ago. The results look like this. I hope most of you sitting out there looking at the slab scope screen going, it's useless. I, look at the, look at the, it's crap. Look at the noise. It's horrible. But, but here, but let's look at something. This is pretty neat. In blue, okay, and that's the top one right here. In blue, I'm in volts. In black, which is all the freaking noise we have here, black is in Ohms, ain't that character cool? Now my scope actually has a little ohm symbol on it. So if I want to print this out for a customer or something, I can look smarter than I am. It's pretty neat at any rate. And you know, I don't know if you guys knew this, but the more colors you add, the more valuable your diagnostics do. So there, there's a lot that you learn along the way. But here's, here's your ohm signal, all right? Now, it's my ohms that I cannot uh, make heads or tails of. I'm going to do something. I am going to uh, bring one of these up live. And I want to show you something. And I'm going to stick with the PicoScope 6 because this is really what most of you guys are using. If you're looking at your screen from home right now, you will see literally the live uh, Pico waveform that I used to build this presentation and that I took off that particular solenoid. I have my channel A in blue, which is volts. So that would be this guy right here. In red, I have my amperage. And I built a math channel to show me the ohms, all right? Now, so here's what we're gonna do. My math channel is extremely noisy. This is a point you're going to want to remember. Math channels once built, for example, the math channel I have built right here in black, this math channel right here cannot be directly filtered. There is no option in PicoScope 6 for me to directly filter this math channel. The reason this math channel in black is so noisy is I asked the scope to divide my voltage by my amperage and give me ohms. He's just doing what I said, but along the way included an incredible amount of noise in his math calculation. So for me to make this resistance value more usable, I need to filter it. But as I mentioned, I can't filter it directly because my filter capabilities are in each one of my channel boxes. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna go to channel A up in the corner. So let's open channel A. And I'm gonna activate my low pass filtering. So I'm gonna start filtering channel A. I click on channel A and it pops up with a number that says 1000 Hertz. All right, there's a couple things you wanna pay attention to here. 
First of all, when I command a low pass software style filter at 1000 Hertz, I am asking my scope from a view standpoint, from what I see on the screen, I'm asking him to ignore any signals that are happening faster than 1000 Hertz or 1000 times per second. I need him to, to ignore that part. Now, what is really spectacular about Pico, and if you've watched any of my other webinars or you've played around with this or talked to other people, you realize that Pico has an adjustable a filter control. So what I'm gonna do is instead of just 1000 Hertz, I'm gonna ask to cut off a little more. Now, before we do that, I'm gonna turn that filter back off. I would like you to watch the black waveform live when I apply this filter. When I turn this filter on, most of you will notice that we saw a decrease in the noise. Not the decrease I'm looking for, but man, we saw a decrease. So I'm gonna come over here and I'm gonna say, okay, I want less, less, less. Now watch guys, you'll notice every time I click this filter down, you are seeing more and more noise disappear from my waveform. Now I'm going to stop at 30 Hertz. That's where I'm gonna stop and I'll show you why in a minute. It's still not clean enough for me. I mean, it's, 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 it's substantially better. It's way better with a 30 hertz low pass filter on it. It's way better. But I want it cleaner. Well, guys, understand, it's not just channel A that I need to filter. Channel B is also part of the equation. So I'm going to go to channel B, and I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to activate the filter on channel B. So there I turned it on. Now you saw a very substantial difference, and I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to go click, click click and I'm going to go down to well let's try the same 30 hertz now what you have the ability to see is a nice crisp clean value for the math of a volts divided by b amps and the value in ohms right here the value in ohms that was left and if I measure that you will notice that it's sitting right at 43 ohms, which is giving us, if you were paying attention, the same reading that we had when we did it with our ohm meter, but now we did it with the circuit 100% live. So my resistance value, guys, isn't just the solenoid. It's the wiring, the connections, the entire circuit, including the solenoid itself. I could let the solenoid warm up, and watch that resistance go up a little bit, but I have all these abilities. Guys, think about the, think about the possibilities. Trans solenoids, injectors, ignition coils, it just doesn't stop. All of these things that tend to break down when they get hot or are just simply under use. Now, let me explain why we're looking at what we are. In the volts, and uh, I'm gonna show you guys another useful feature right here. I'm gonna come up to views because I'm live right now. I'm gonna come up to my view box in the top, I'm gonna open this up, and uh, there's lots of options in here that are really beyond the scope of where we're at, but I'm gonna come down to channels, and I'm gonna come here and say, you know, for right now, let's just shut off B, and let's shut off dynamic resistance. So here is just my volts. So what you're really seeing here is my voltage was at zero when the circuit was turned off, and then went up to uh, 12 volts, 12.2, when it was turned on. I'm only going to have resistance values that are going to show up when it's turned on, not off, on, and not off and on. But I want to, sh I want to warn you guys of something at this point. I'm going to go back into channel A, and I'm going to play with this filter a little bit more. I'm going to take a vertical cursor, and I'm going to put a cursor here so you can see that sharp turnoff point, and I'm going to move a vertical cursor here so you can see the sharp turnoff point. I've got to caution you guys with the filtering aspects of Pico that you can hurt yourself. And here's what I'm going to show you. If I continue getting aggressive, watch what happens. Okay. Now, I'd like a show of hands from you guys is to make sure you're not sleeping again. I'd like a show of hands from you guys. It should be in the controls on your screen of how many of you realize that I have ruined my waveform by over filtering it. 
Can you see that it's nowhere near what it was when I started? And uh, okay, 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 that's plenty of hands. You can put them all down. Okay, that rocketed up. That worked great. All right. Hey, there's some that aren't sleeping, guys. That's fantastic. All right. So at any rate, I need to make sure when I'm filtering that I watch my waveform to make sure that I do not get too aggressive. All right. So then I can come back up here. I can turn my views right back on again and bring back A and bring back my resistance. And now I'm going to go hide A and B. And now we can really see what the resistance did. Uh, we'll hide those cursors. So when my circuit was turned on, it was turned on there, off, on here, off, on. It was at that basically 43, 44 ohms. And it's just a brilliant test method. And like I said, guys, if you really take nothing else out of this class, this is something I'd like you to get a grasp on uh, when you make it back out in the field. Now, one of the comments or questions that typically comes up when I talk about this, they go, well, what about these spikes, Adam? You've got these big spikes of, uh, of, of resistance. The resistance, hang on, guys. Remember, remember, we are looking at dynamic operating resistance. When I turn a circuit on and off, there are voltage spikes, there's rush-in current, there's drops in voltage. The picoscope isn't, the picoscope doesn't know he's measuring resistance like a standard ohm meter. All he knows he's doing is the math that I asked him to do. So as he did the math, he included the actual math of the turning on and off. And you'll get used to that uh, as time goes on. So uh, let's go ahead and uh, we'll go past that and we'll get back into our presentation. Hey, uh, time for me to take another breath here. Hey, uh, guys on the panel, I know I've kind of ignored you over there. Uh, do we have any questions? Does everything seem to be going on okay? Is there anything I need to pay attention to? Well, you know, Adam, there's a pretty good discussion going on in the sidelines here about using math channels to measure dynamic resistance. And are there components or areas of that signal where a math channel wouldn't be accurate or wouldn't apply to well, measure resistance? Uh, no. Actually, but here's uh, here's kind of that was kind of a loaded no that I put out. Um, as far as our usefulness of the math, y yes, because for example, the spikes that you saw. Remember, we asked the scope to take everything he saw in voltage and everything he saw in amperage and mathemize it out, bring it out, and tell me the resistance. The changes that happen during those rapid turn-ons and the rapid turn-offs are going to give you undesired results on the screen, but technically still fall within Ohm's law. For example, turning on a light bulb is a good example of this. If you've ever tried to use Ohm's law on a light bulb, you've measured the filament of the light bulb, you got resistance, you plugged it in, all of a sudden, dynamically, the resistance is completely different because of the heat that it generated and the resistance changes. You need to understand that as current changes in a circuit, so will that resistance value. But honestly, Randy, and this is a great question, uh, for, for most purposes, the dead straight uh, resistance values you get are going to be the useful ones for most of us in that purpose. Okay. And I, well, I hope that answered that. Todd made the comment that since the inductor is saturated, when it's saturated, that's a good time to trust the accuracy mm -hmm. of that. Uh, when the inductor is not saturated, such as an ignition coil, it could pose some problems then, I assume. Yes. And like I said, anytime we change up to the point that we become saturated, you can have those changes show. And practice is going to take that a long way. And uh, Todd, that was a fantastic way to state that with the saturation. But uh, yes, so I, I hope that answered everything there. All right, let's, uh, let's continue on. Uh, now that you guys had a chance, well, now that I had a chance to breathe, let's mix this up a little bit more. I, uh, I have put a picture on the screen in front of you of something that may look a little bit confusing. Some of you may look at this and go, well, Adam, that looks like a Nissan 350Z. Yeah, if you were gonna be a little closer, you'd know what happened in Fresno, California too, but that part, that really doesn't matter. But what you should notice is that I have a battery. I have a negative cable coming off the battery. I've got the battery cable disconnected. But I have what appears to be a jumper wire coming off the negative side going through this green box, going through this fuse, and connecting right to the body of the vehicle. One of the, one of the issues that we have, one of the issues that we have, and uh, I'm going to, uh, I'm gonna do something uh, real quick here, guys, so just uh, hang in here with me. 
I'm going to make a small change to my screen so we can make this uh, be a little more accurate. Uh, let's go ahead and bring that back up. Okay, so if you look at the picture that we have right here, I'm going to now bring up a different background for myself. Um, here's, here's one of the problems we've got. I'm gonna take uh, this current probe right here. I'll, I'll hold this up. Most of you guys can see this now that I have a, a regular background. This is a 30 amp low amp current probe with a jaw that's large enough, like I've stuck my finger through it right here, to allow us to hook it around a battery cable to do a parasitic draw. So I can use this 30 amp low amp current probe with my lab scope. And as you can see in the picture, you can kind of see the end of it sticking out right about here down towards the bottom. But I could use this around a battery cable to do a parasitic draw or battery draw for a long period. The problem is this, every one of you realizes that these probes will eat nine volt batteries up. It's an endless uh, world. If you, I mean, come on guys, you'll buy stock in nine volt batteries if you're a, a current probe user. The problem is this, if you take your low amp current probe and you turn it on and you wanna measure the parasitic draw from a vehicle over an extended time period, okay? Now think about this extended time period. We're not talking five minutes, 10 minutes. We're talking 10 hours, 12 hours, 24 hours. Guys, your battery would be stone dead in that period of time. Plus, if you're an avid, if you're an avid uh, user, especially with a current probe that looks like this one, if you're an avid user of low amp current probes and high amp for that matter, but we're talking low here, you'll realize that they also creep. They don't maintain their original value when you zero them out. So here's the challenge. I know that many of you either have or will have a car that comes in that the battery goes dead overnight. It's not working the next day. And uh, you may bring it in the shop and say, I don't see too much parasitic draw. Everything looks fine to me. Yeah, but what if in the middle of the night, a module wakes up, has a party, or a light bulb turns on, draws everything down, goes back to sleep. Maybe you've got a, a blower motor that turns on because of a bad resistor, whatever it be. Can a draw? Can a draw happen in the middle of the night that kills the battery and not be there the next day? And I'm telling you, if you haven't run into it yet, you will. So I need to have a way that I can do an extended time period parasitic draw. Okay, couple answers to this. If you guys have paid attention to the newest model of PicoScope that's come out, the 4425A, uh, there's actually a couple YouTube videos out on it. Uh, if you're looking at that new lab scope, it have powered probes for it. So you actually will can plug a low amp current probe into it. And instead of having a battery that runs on the uh, lab scope box itself powers the probe. Understand though, that those probes are gonna cost about twice what your normal probes do. And many of us haven't stepped up to that plate yet. This is uh, what we would call a shunt resistor concept that I'm using here. And uh, well, here's, here's, uh, here's my shunt resistor. So basically what I've got, and I'll pull this apart so you can see. I basically have taken a resistor, okay? So here's, here's a resistor right here. I've got a resistor and I have a fuse installed right there and I have two ends. That is what I've hooked up to this car between the negative cable and the ground. Any energy that this car consumes is going to have to go through this contraption. But the key is, and here's where math channels come into play. The key is this. I know that Ohm's law can give me things like resistance values and current values and voltage values as long as I know one or the other. I have to know two to get the third uh, member of that. So if I know the value of the resistor, and in this case, guys, I, I'm using a 0.1 ohm resistor, uh, 0 0.1 ohms, but if I have a resistor here and I measure the voltage on this side of the resistor, and I measure the voltage on this side of the resistor. We know that anytime current flows in a circuit, anytime current flows, voltage will drop across any resistor. The key is this, if I know the value of the resistor, if I know the fixed value of the resistor, and I can read the voltage drop from one side to the other, I can calculate out the approximate amps that are going through that resistor. So what I do is I hook my lab scope from one side to the other side. So I am reading physically the voltage drop across this resistor. Now, before I go too far, 
There are tools available out there for sale that do basically this, but I'm going to warn you of something. If you play with this and you play with these things often, and I've done quite a bit of testing with this, it becomes critical. If you want exact, accurate values, you must have very, very high quality, very uh, 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 low percentage rate accuracies uh, or, or fluctuation, I should say. Uh, some of these, uh, a resistor like this costs you probably about 30 bucks or so. Uh, the accuracy of this is a little bit questionable, but it's enough for me to do this. Uh, once again, that's for another class. But what I want to do now is I want to show you live what these results might look like. So I'm going to go ahead. Uh, Adam, quick question yeah, from Chad. Uh, yeah. The ohmic value of that resistor Yes. Was that 0.1 ohms or could it be 1 ohm? Okay, I have both. I do not have the 1 ohm here. Uh, in my experience with the testing I've done, I prefer 0.1 ohms. It seems to be the, mo the best for me from an accuracy standpoint uh, because it's easier to get a uh, higher percentage of accuracy with the lower values. But here's one of the problems. If you're going to do this style testing, there's a second step to it you need to make sure that you have enough resistance that the wattage of the car doesn't burn up your resistor and blow your fuses. For example, if this thing were going to draw too much amperage at this point, let's say I got in, I tried to crank the starter over. What do you think is going to happen to my resistor? I mean, this should be pretty straightforward. Poof, it's gone. So the real answer to that, and like I said, I like 0.1 ohms, but I do have a one ohm resistor, is that the higher the, excuse me, the more resistance you have, the less resistance you have, either direction you go is going to affect the wattage. And Ohm's law is going to have to be taken into account there too. Okay. Uh, but I uh, use 0.1. Yeah. Just so, just so you know, I put a link up there to a point, or excuse me, a 1% tolerant resistor at one ohm. And I'll repeat that same thing with a tenth of an ohm so the guys yeah, can make, and make their sure. Choice. Make sure you check the wattage. This is a 100 watt resistor. That makes a difference. Uh, when I started practicing with this, I smoldered some. Uh, man, I made the same mistakes everyone else does. And man, can they burn up fast. Damn, they get hot. At any rate, the point behind it is make sure you got enough wattage. Mine's a, mine's a 100 watt rating. So we'll get into that a little bit later uh, for uh, you, Randy. So let's go ahead and take a look at this. Let me, uh, let me grab a waveform. Uh, you know what? I will just come over here and open one up. Uh, we'll go ahead and use PicoScope 6 to stick with this, uh, the dynamic that we're doing here. So I'm going to go ahead and pull up a live value of using my 0.1 ohm resistor. I'm going to come up here and I'm going to get rid of a view. So I'm going to get rid of channel B. And, and before I do this, I'll tell you why. Channel B, guys, this channel B right here is my low amp current probe telling me the actual amps in the circuit. But for my purposes, I'm going to get rid of that view. So I'm going to get rid of B. So let's say I had one channel of my lab scope hooked across this resistor and I'm looking at voltage drop. My voltage drop is at that point about 27 millivolts. Right here, it's about 100 millivolts. Right here, it's at 216 millivolts. And right here, it's at uh, 243 millivolts. But here's the key. I don't want millivolts, guys. I want to know how many amps are going through this circuit. So I'm going to build a math channel to take the math of this one channel and turn it into amperage. So let's go ahead and go up to my tools menu. Let's go into math channels. And, uh, well, here's a cheater one, but I'm going to go ahead and delete that so you don't get to see it. Poof, it is gone. Matter of fact, I'm going to get rid of that one too. Poof, it is gone too. So uh, basically, that's one of the things you can do. So right now, I'm going to build from scratch a math channel for this. So it says, well, what do you want to do? Well, I'm going to create a math channel. All right, this wizard helps you. What is it? Okay, well, okay, right, let's hit next. Cool. What do you want to do? All right. I need to build a math channel that is going to divide my voltage by my known resistance value. So I'm going to come in here and I'm going to go channel A because it's channel A. I'm going to go divide and I need to divide it by a value. The value I'm going to divide it by is my 0.1 ohms. Now watch this. If I simply go 0.1 you'll notice this still has an invalid formula. Ah, this frustrated me too. It doesn't accept A divided by 0.1. What it will accept, watch this. 
let's go back a little, a divided by 0 0.1. A divided by 0 0.1 is an acceptable formula. The 0 0.1 was the value of my resistor. So I'm going to hit next. And it says, OK, A divided by 0.01. I'm going to leave it in black. Next, it says, what do you want to call it? Well, I'll just call it uh, amps, because that's what it is. I'll call that amps. And uh, short name, we'll just call it an A. So now it's A is the short name. I'm not going to worry about overriding. I'm just going to hit next. And it says, here's your formula, finish. And let's go ahead and click that. And OK, see what it looks like. And right now, I have got. This is so freaking cool. I've got a amperage channel of my value. So right here, when my voltage was at, say, uh, well, about 36 millivolts, I actually was drawing uh, 390 milliamps were coming through the circuit at this point. Now, I will tell you, this is what the car had originally being shut off. So obviously at 300 milliamps or almost 400, it was too much. But I was just trying to make a presentation here to show you what I did next. When the voltage drop climbed right here to this point, when it climbed, I opened one of the doors. By opening the door, we saw an increase in amperage up to over an amp. Well, we saw the increase in amperage. Why? By opening the door, did we maybe have modules turned on or did we have lights come on, that sort of thing? And then I said, well, I'm going to open the glove box. So I turned on another light right here. I turned on another light and it draw, it had more voltage drop and now it has more current. And then over here, I stepped on the brakes, if I remember correctly, it had a bigger voltage drop, bigger current. But the nice thing is for those of you who use you know, we're playing with your Picos, realize that I could build one screen that could easily be put on that car for a, an incredible amount of time, nine hours, 12 hours, whatever it be. So there's another example of how math channels can be used um, to help us with some of our daily, daily routines. Is that making sense to everybody? If it is, I'd, I'd, I'd like to see a show of hands there, if I could. Uh, okay, the hands are flying through. Perfect. Hey, this is a good time for me to bring something up as we climb back into this program too. Um, all of you that are listening out there, when we get done with this presentation over the next day or so, you're going to get a thank you email for participating in our program. In that thank you email, there will be a link for questions and comments to Randy Briggs. Uh, if you guys have any questions about the class or uh, comments about it, or you need to know more information, please send Randy an email. Uh, Randy will get together, we'll discuss it, and we'll get you back with an answer. So uh, that'll happen when you get your thank you email that comes through. So if for some reason you had a question and I raced by it too quick, um, because we really are on a limited clock here, that's a way that you can still get some of your questions answered. All right, let's go ahead and step forward here to another topic. Next, I want to talk about building math channels with what I'm calling the advanced function tab. Here's an advanced function tab. Now, this is truly where the Pico 7 math wizard is starting to simplify these. Uh, they're really starting to make things a little bit easier for you. But I'll do a couple advanced features and show you how you guys can get working on it. If I open up the advanced tab, so I come in here to build a math channel and I click on advanced, it will give me four options or four menus. We have a main set of math capabilities, a trigonometric set, we have buffered, and we have filters. Now, as you look at these, uh, look, like I said, man, I'm just being completely honest with you. Under the main, I typically in the main only use a few of them. I use frequency a lot, which you'll see. I use duty cycle quite a bit. Uh, the crank is for RPM, although it's menuing, it's, it's, it's sequence, different than Pico 7, difficult to use, but I use those ones quite often. I also, myself, I skip the trig functions, the buffered functions. I use filters, uh, more precisely on filters. I don't use high pass, I use low pass filtering right here, and I'll show you that before we get done tonight. But just because I don't typically use these other functions, here is where your imagination and your mathematical capabilities really will keep you from being limited uh, in what you can do with your waveforms. So. At any rate, let's go ahead and uh, step forward. So one thing that has been a great help to me, 
And uh, you guys, once again, if you take nothing else out of the classes, if this is, you know, you're, you're trying to absorb this stuff, use the user's guide. The user's guide's phenomenal. And you'll notice here, I simply have a base Pico 6 screen up here. And you'll see that it has the file, the edit, the views, the measurements, the tools, automotive. But under the help column, you have one that says user's guide. Make sure you take the time to use the user's guide because in there, it's got an incredible search engine and anything you could even, anything you could even imagine is in there. For example, if I come over here and I just go to the search function, when I open up the user's guide, for example, I put in advanced math. Well, it pops up and tells us what every one of those buttons do. For So by golly, if you wanna get into trigonometric features of your math, you just go in here and it'll explain everything you need to be ultimately confused. But no, you can come in here and it'll really help you out with that. And so make sure you take the time to uh, look at that help file. All right, so let's go ahead and begin. The first one we're gonna do is we're gonna build a frequency math channel. Frequency can be used for a lot of things, guys. As, as you will see, we've got plenty of time left in this presentation. I'll show you how I can use frequency for things like uh, high-speed mass air flows, uh, one of very, very common place I use them. Uh, they can use for be wheel speed sensors, crank sensors, lots of things. Uh, we are now starting to learn how to use frequency measurement uh, to look for crankshaft acceleration in helping us diagnose misfires, which I'll show you a couple of those here in a little bit too. So let's go ahead and build this frequency math channel. First thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna open up my advanced. So I hit my advanced button and I opened up main. When I opened up main, all of these functions came out. All I have done so far, guys, is I've just clicked frequency. When I clicked frequency, freak shows up with the parentheses. Now by itself, and I didn't save that for you, by itself, there will be once again, the red button telling you you're not complete. Once you hit frequency and it comes up, it asks you what channel you wanna use, A, B, C, D, maybe the drop down menu if you're an eight, uh, eight channel user, but I wanna do frequency of A. I put in frequency of A. Next, it says, name it. Well, it names it frequency A already because it was a preset. All right, so frequency A, I like the name. Uh, maybe we'll color it purple on this one. Doesn't matter, we could change that at point if we wanted to. In here, the units will already be filled in because once again, it's a preset. It's frequency. It knows that frequency is a measurement of time uh, in Hertz. So it already puts Hertz. It puts our short name as Hertz. And then there's this. Uh, guys, I, I, I wanna talk about this for a minute because it was a question that came up from Monday night's class. Notice right now that I have not clicked this override automatic range selection. The automatic range selection will allow it to automatically choose the range it feels best uh, on your screen. Notice here that it's got a minimum of zero and a maximum of a million. If your range is too broad, let's say for example, you wanna measure a frequency of one, thousand hertz you have a signal that you think is going 1000 times per second if you have a signal that you think is going 1000 times a second you don't want a range that goes from zero to one million because it'll have zero to one million and you won't see any deviations in that so one of the things to understand about range is i will find myself once i get a frequency on the screen I will in many cases come in here and I'll show you this a little bit later. I will come in, I will override this and I will build a minimum and a maximum that fits the actual values of what I'm trying to do, all right? And I'll show you that an example. So let's go ahead and move forward here. All right, Adam, uh, it's complete. You chose A, frequency A, purple. Your range goes from zero to one megahertz units. Boom, we're all set to go. So it pops up in my library, frequency A. Let's go ahead and apply it. I'm going to uh, blow this up for you and uh, we, can, uh, well, we can discuss this a little bit. The top waveform that you see right here is very blue and doesn't show much detail. Now, just to give you a heads up, not that this should matter. I know it's probably coming a little bit blurry uh, to you guys, but I'll fix that in a minute. This was taken off a 1989 Buick Century with a 
it really doesn't matter what vehicle it was taken off of. But I will tell you, this blue bar is the mass airflow sensor signal. The mass airflow sensor signal, if you want to look at that, went from zero volts right here up to five volts right here. So it went zero to five. Now, I want to draw your attention to the bottom of the screen. On the lower left-hand side of the screen, you will see that it says 2.5, and then there's a small icon right here that says S for seconds. Now, it goes from 2.5 seconds all the way across to 7.5 seconds. That means this entire screen, guys, this entire screen is five seconds long. All right. Five seconds is not a long period of time, guys. A lot can happen in five seconds. Here's one of the problems uh, lab scopes in general run into. I am looking at a signal that changes from zero volts to five volts and zero volts to five volts and zero to five volts, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. In just five seconds of time, how does my waveform quality look to you? And I'm hoping you're looking at this and you go, Adam, it looks like a great big blue bar. As a matter of fact, I can't see waveform quality. All I see is a big block of information. I can't tell how good it looks. I can't tell anything. I can't tell anything because I'm looking at five whole seconds. Well, guys, if, if you've got a mass airflow that's causing you problems, it may happen in a fraction of a period of time where you may not even catch it. Now, now, now you users... You Pico users, look up here at this box at the top. You'll realize that this box, I'm already zoomed in two times. If I want to get some detail out of this, I have to zoom into this. Now, I just want you to picture this. And th at this view, I can see nice pull to ground, nice rise to five volts. Nice pull to ground, nice rise to five volts. At this view, I can see good waveform quality. The problem is, in order for me to see this kind of detail, I had to zoom in. Guys, look at this number on the top. Okay, there's my cursor back. Look at this number right here on the top. This number on the top says 326 times. That literally means, let's go back here. That literally means that I had to zoom in 326 times deeper to see the detail in this. Do you realize that in order for me to analyze this waveform, in order for me to analyze this waveform right here, this guy right here, in order to analyze that, I would have to look at 326 screens just like this to look for a single dropout. That's it's insane. You're never going to do that. And even if you think you can, you're never going to catch it. So why not? Why not teach my lab scope? Why not teach my lab scope with simple math? Why don't I ask it, hey, here is my frequency. Why don't you, using math, tell me what my frequency did during this five seconds of time? So what you see over here on the right is I have a graph that says 9.7 kilohertz or 1,000 hertz, and down at the bottom it's zero. But my math channel right here in black it shows that right here, so let's start at this side of the screen, and I've got my, I've got my uh, uh, measurement cursor, my uh, horizontal cursor. It says right here, that measurement is 2,769 cycles per second. But it's also showing that it remained flat at 2,700 hertz. It was flat, 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 27, 27, 27, and all this sudden something dramatic happened here. What happened here was my frequency actually dropped out. My frequency dropped out to, well, if I wanted to estimate it, I'd say about 1,700 hertz. Guys, if this car was sitting here idling in my shop, there's no way that that mass error flow should have been a nice 2,700, 2,700, 2,700, and dropped all of a sudden to 17. That should not have happened unless instantaneously my airflow came in and changed. I know at that speed, my airflow physically couldn't have even done that. That dropout is very common and a, and a very easy spotting of a bad mass airflow. And then if we watch this continue on, it had a monster dropout here. This dropout dropped all the way down to 1,000 hertz. This could cause a stumble. It could cause stalling. It could cause 
fuel trim errors, lots of things can happen on the car, but with conventional lab scope testing of looking at the blue bar and zooming in, by the way, guys, you see this black swoop in this screen? This black swoop that you see right here is the frequency changing from 2.7 and dropping down to 1,000 uh, hertz. But during that period of time, I see that it's faster here. It's faster, faster, faster. It got slower, then it started speeding up again. But the waveform quality looked good. And there's no way you're going to find this without this. And that is where a frequency measurement can help you find issues. Now, this picture that I'm showing you right now, it happens to be a repaired version of that. And uh, let's see, I'm at 7.3 seconds over here to 9.8 seconds over here. So two and a half seconds basically on the screen. And here's my frequency. I rev the car up, I decelerated, I revved it up. I didn't actually totally snap the throttle, but in two and a half seconds, I went vroom, vroom, revved it up a couple times. And I get to see a nice smooth increase in frequency, a drop in frequency. Nice increase in frequency, drop in frequency that I could not normally see in the waveform quality itself. So I can see that those dropouts aren't there. I can see the speed and the response of my frequency change. Now, I'd like to see another show of hands uh, if you guys understood kind of what I'm getting across to you right here. Did that make sense to you? Do, you? do you see some value in this? And once again, we've got uh, the hands are going up. That's awesome. You can go ahead and uh, drop those back down. Uh, hey, guys, once again, asking the panel over here. Once again, I, uh, I apologize for ignoring you. I've got you sitting on my other screen over here, and you're not – you're not poking fun at me. You're not laughing. You're not shaking your head. No, uh, we going okay with you all right still? Okay. So far, so good. All right. Thanks, man. All right. So let's, uh, let's, go, ahead and, uh, let's go ahead and continue on. The next picture I have, uh, ne next picture I have for you here, uh, I've got a vehicle that stalls, and I know this sound looks odd to you, but I said this vehicle stalls when the injector pulse width triples. All right, let, let me explain this. Once again, the type of vehicle does not matter, but it's only fair for me to share it with you. This is a 1993 Buick Park Avenue. Look, before any of you think it or say it, yeah, if I'd have gone out and just give the old tap test on the GM mass airflow sensor, the car would have stalled. <laughs> As a matter of fact, it did stall when I tapped on it, but that's not what this class is about. I want to use the same tools and prove that this mass airflow sensor is bad. So there's a little bit more to the busyness of this screen going on here in that on the top of the screen, I have in blue, I have a crankshaft waveform. I have a camshaft waveform. We're going to ignore those for right now. Uh, in green right here above the red, that is a current probe hooked to my fuel injector. Now, when you're looking at a fuel injector, you'll see it's drawing about one amp and you can see it drawing, bang, 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 bang. Right here, you see that pulse width grow immensely. That is where the pulse width of the injector about tripled in size. What you need to understand is this car was just idling. Guys, if you've got a car that's sitting there idling in the shop, and all of a sudden the injectors say, hey, we're going to triple in pulse width, what do you think the car did? That's where it stumbled and died. But in black, as we've been using up till now, I have a graph of the frequency of my mass airflow that's in red. So here's my beautiful zero to five volt waveform of my mass airflow. But look at, the, look at what the frequency was doing. My gosh, right here, this thing's idling, and my frequency is all over the place. It's going from anywhere from about 8,000 hertz to 11,000. There's no way this frequency should be going bang, 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 all like this. That frequency should have been relatively stable. And right here, out of the clear blue, with no one telling it to do this, my frequency shot from uh, about 8 or whatever all the way up to about 12. That's when he started tripling the pulse width, and there was no saving it. And the car was stalling. Even while the car was dying out, there was still almost 10,000 hertz coming out of the mass airflow. It's definitely trash. But... The reason I added that into this explanation is we have yet another math channel on this graph that we haven't discussed yet. And it's over on the right-hand side, and you'll see that it says percentage. See that little icon at the top? It's percentage. 
That percentage is duty cycle. Now, most input sensors, most, and uh, please, if your hair's on fire, you can talk about it in the chat, but most, most input sensors run a fixed duty cycle. What I mean is they don't alter or vary the duty cycle coming in. That's a good majority of them. And this mass airflow is no different. This mass airflow should have had a stable duty cycle. The ons and offs, the ons and offs, ons and offs should be very, very stable. It was relatively stable here, but look at what the duty cycle was doing during the period that it was freaking out. I have swings in my on versus off time. So my on versus off was changing around, causing duty cycle fluctuations also. Now, you might look at this and say, wow, okay, hold on. So you built not just one math channel to look at that mass airflow. You built a frequency channel and you built a duty cycle channel. You're looking at two math channels to look at that. Hey, if you were paying attention in the beginning of class, I told you, the imagination is your only limitation and I can put up to eight total channels on any one screen I wanted. And right now I've got one, two, three, four, five, six. I've got room for two more. And if that's not enough, I can add another scope view up to nine more scopes. So like I said, I could add as many as I want. But there you go is a picture of another bad mass airflow. And in all fairness, here's a picture of it when it was repaired. Now, I dropped the duty cycle off of this. The duty cycle was sturdy. But now you can see I've got a nice about 3,000 hertz. I snapped the throttle. It went up, came down. Snap the throttle. Snap the throttle, snap the throttle. Of course, during the snap throttles, you can see that increase in injector pulse width. That's what you're looking at right there. And if you're looking at this, you can kind of see the increase in uh, uh, a crankshaft speed too. But once again, the point of this was the analyzation of this mass airflow uh, sensor right here. And you can see the nice smoothness, definitely better than this crap we had back here. All right. So, We've got, uh, we've got about half an hour left in this program, guys. And uh, just to give you a heads up, I'll stick around as long as necessary to answer questions. So if you're sitting there and you're chewing on a question you don't want to ask yet, if you want to wait to the end of the program, like I said, we'll stick around. We'll ask if there's any questions, and I will stick around for you. But uh, I want to take this to another level in the remaining time that I have here and take this frequency math channel to another concept. If you guys are paying attention uh, to the changes uh, that are happening in our industry as far, far as uh, tools are concerned, you may have noticed that, for example, uh, uh, Bernie, Bernie has a new tool out, Automotive Test Solutions, or a new feature where he's looking at crankshaft acceleration, measuring the frequency, and then allowing us to look for misfires. And if you think about this, how does the dude in the dash, how does the dude in the dash figure out that we have a cylinder that's misfiring? And I hope that most of you are sitting there going, well, Adam, you know, uh, he looks at crankshaft acceleration. Well, isn't it true that as the crankshaft goes around, every time a cylinder fires, there's a burst of acceleration out of the crankshaft. A little burst, a little burst, a little burst. If the dude in the dash was fast enough, if the signal was clean enough, if the signal had enough uh, pulses, for example, if it had enough teeth on it, don't you think he could look at the acceleration watch the even acceleration, or in some cases, the uneven acceleration of the crankshaft to determine that maybe a cylinder didn't contribute when it was supposed to. And the answer is yes. And, and, and I, guys, this is going to take some practice from you. And I do suggest you practice, and I suggest you practice a lot. It's not as easy as, I, as maybe I'm going to make this look appear uh, or appear to you guys. Here's the thing. I have taken in black, which is this waveform right in the middle of the screen, and I have done a frequency graph of my channel A, which is on the top. Channel A is the crankshaft position sensor signal on a 2004 Dodge Durango with a 4.7 V8. So this is a square wave crankshaft position sensor on a V8. On the bottom of the screen, you will notice that I have got a waveform of an in-cylinder compression waveform taken from one of the cylinders. Now, obviously, this class doesn't get into the analyzation of a uh, in-cylinder waveform, but most of you sitting there should agree that if I am on this screen 
taking a waveform of an in-cylinder pressure waveform, I had to pull the spark plug out, install my transducer. Therefore, I guarantee you this cylinder right here is misfiring. It misfired here. It misfired here. It misfired here. I hope you would all agree with that because we're looking at the pressure changes and the spark plug's gone. But what's cool about this is it gives me a great uh, a practice tool to create a misfire. But come on, any of you can create a misfire in a car. Any one of you can create a misfire in a car. Run out, unplug a coil. Run out, unplug an injector. It's that easy. But what's nice about what I'm doing here, and this is one of the ways I practice is, not only guys have I created a misfire, I know absolutely exactly which cylinder's misfiring, and more importantly, I know exactly the piston placement during the misfire. That's what makes this style testing for practice so good. Now let's watch how this works. When I set up my frequency channel, I wanna show you something. Remember this, I'm gonna go back and uh, real quick show you guys something. Remember when I talked about the range override? Remember I said there's times I wanna hit this button? Now, look at what I've done in this waveform. In this waveform, I have changed my range from a minimum of 140 hertz to 220 hertz. The reason I did that is I wanted nice resolution of the minor changes in acceleration frequency graphed on the screen. Had I have chose too broad of a, a range, this would look like just a straight line. And as you can see, guys, this crankshaft that looks very, very smooth in this picture actually accelerates, decelerates, accelerates, decelerates, accelerates, decelerates. And what's nice about the practice of this waveform is you can see there's actually a wave to this operation. So you can see that we accelerated, decelerated, accelerated, decelerated, accelerated, decelerated, but look at this. My crankshaft hit its slowest possible point right here. That's the slowest point that this crankshaft was spinning because when the piston went up on the compression stroke here, we were expecting a burst of power as the piston went down to increase the speed of the crank. That did not happen. It actually decelerated. But then you'll notice the crankshaft got faster, 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 up to the point that this happened again. Faster, 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 it happened again. So this drop in crankshaft speed, although very, very minimal, shows the point that the crankshaft slowed down due to a lack of power generated and another piston coming up on a compression stroke. But what's neat about this is you'll notice there is literally one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight accelerations in that 720 degrees or two crankshaft revolutions. I, I gotta, I've got to see a show of hands here from you. Is that freaking cool or what? And that's got to be cool to you. Oh, got even more hands that time. All right. Eh, told you it was neat. All right. So here's the thing. Those, that acceleration right there could be used for us to help to determine where a misfire or where a crankshaft slowed down. So before you think this is really neat, I have to be fair and put in yet another type of vehicle. The next vehicle we're going to look at the same way. And I know some of you are thinking it. Hey, it's a 4.6 North Star. Yeah, there's actually one still running out there. I hope I didn't hurt anyone's feelings, but don't worry, it leaks a bunch of oil, so we're all okay. At any rate, I have the crankshaft position sensor on the top. I have the frequency graph here, and before one of you guys says it, I know, yes, there's two crankshaft sensors. I only chose one of them. But what I want to show you here is how dynamically different the shape of the reluctor ring will make your frequency graphs look. So this is why practice is gonna be so incredibly important to you guys, because without practice, you are not gonna know what they look like. So here's what we've got. Uh, I just love this, guys. And, and for you advanced lab scope users, this is pretty cool. I'm hooked into my crankshaft sensor. Here's my battery voltage coming in. 
my drop-in voltage as the starter engages. The voltage goes back up, be, starts beginning to speed up, and then we get, grab uh, our RPMs that comes through. This is the frequency graph of my crankshaft position sensor getting overall faster and then slower as it comes back down to a stable idle. What's different about this is the shape or configuration of my frequency. My frequency slows, is even, speeds. Slows, or it's even, slows, even, speeds, even, slows, even. That doesn't look anything like the waveform that I had on my 4.7 Durango. That is because the design of the reluctor ring, let's make this a little bit bigger. The design of the reluctor ring has different duty cycle spacing. So you'll see we have longer, 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 shorter, 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 longer, 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 shorter, shorter, shorter. When you build a math channel, the math channel of the PicoScope does not understand what you're truly doing. He just said, hey, you want to know how fast it's going? I'll tell you. So he recognizes the length difference in the pulses as increases and decreases in speed. So even though this has these increases and decreases, increases and decreases. The point here is, is this engine had no misfires and we have a nice even set of those acceleration decel, acceleration decel, which really the crankshaft isn't accelerating and decelerating, it's smooth, but the shape of the reluctor ring is causing the interpretation to show that. And that's why I, I, I can't stress hard enough to you, you practice on lots of different vehicles, all right? So let's try one more. Here is a uh, frequency math channel that I have hooked up to a four cylinder, a four cylinder with no misfires. But as you will see, I used a different type of crankshaft position sensor. We're now looking at a crankshaft position sensor that is of an MR magnetic reluctance or VR variable reluctance design that has a number one sink, or I should just call it a sink. Now, the frequency goes up, down, up, down, up, down and if you can kind of bridge this area right here where the sink is so if you were to imagine taking a pencil and drawing this in here and then drawing it in here and then drawing it in here you would really see that this four cylinder engine from this cursor right here on the left to the cursor on the right is two full crankshaft revolutions or 720 degrees what you see is that my my crankshaft accelerates decelerates, accelerates, decelerates, decelerates. And what you notice is it has an even acceleration, an even deceleration. And between this point and this point, or two complete crank revolutions or all four cycles, we have four very vivid acceleration and deceleration events in between. And But what you got to understand here is this massive drop in frequency right here is because our math channel is also including uh, the missing teeth that are right here, tooth, teeth, whatever it be on this car. And so you have to sometimes be able to draw in or imagine uh, what that frequency of that uh, a crankshaft sensor looks like, all right? So I, I hope that made sense to you too. And, and, and once again, I hope that it once again stresses uh, how important it is that you uh, practice with this with different vehicles. And Yet the last one, and I was going to eliminate this from this program actually, but every time I looked at this and I said, man, I need to eliminate this. I need to eliminate it. I realized, no, guys, I really got to show it. Um, this is a, a, a General Motors 2.2 liter four-cylinder that does have a misfire. And man, I hope at this point you guys are sitting there going, Adam, of course, it's got a misfire. You've got a compression waveform on the bottom. Yes, I do. Once again, once again, guys. To practice this the way you should, adding a compression waveform is really dynamic. It's helped me out a lot from a piston position standpoint. But I have now chosen yet another type of crankshaft position sensor that has a double spike, six, a double spike, six. And this is even a four-cylinder car, so it doesn't even make a lot of sense. But yet I can still see with practice that the slowest frequency, even though the frequency slows, speeds up, but as all this jumping around, there is still a very vivid maximum slow peak when this cylinder went into decompression rather than power 
uh, because there was a misfire. So you guys can see this, but without practice, going to be tough. I'd like to throw in a be careful statement. Uh, this is just a, a word of warning on, yeah, this is cool stuff, Adam. This is great. We're going to take this out. We're going to find misfires. Well, I have a small case study or waveform that I took off a 1998 Toyota RAV4 with a two liter that runs horrible. Now, when I say this runs horrible, it runs so bad you can't even drive it around the block. It's bad. And what I've done, it, I had other waveforms, don't get me wrong, but I want to concentrate this to our topic. I have a crankshaft position in blue. This is my crankshaft position sensor. And I have the frequency graph in black. Now, you should be able to see that this frequency looks like it is jumping all over the board. I mean, it's going from a minimum of about 230 all the way to 600 hertz. It's just all over the place. I'm going to zoom in to show you what you're actually looking at here. What you're looking at is a relatively stable main frequency with several dropouts, but not the top of dro type of dropouts that you would expect. See, you would normally think or expect that you would have a dropout where the sink is. So, hey, I've got a sink, here's a dropout. I've got a sink, here's a dropout. I've got a sink, here's a dropout. But what you're really seeing in this is, wait a minute. I have a dropout, a dropout, a dropout, a dropout, a dropout, a dropout. I have all these dropouts, yet they're not even the same depth of each other in dropout. It's almost like there's a cylinder that's misfiring or, and I know many of you are realizing this as you look at this in the top, you realize that it appears that this has two, two sinks. Wait a minute. But if it's got two sinks, this sink and this sink, one has more of a frequency dropout than the other. It goes less, more, less, more, less, more, less, more. Because if you look closely at this, guys, it has two different style sinks. One is wider than the other, therefore having a different impact on the frequency. So the engine is actually hitting all the cylinders from an acceleration deceleration standpoint. It just has extra dropouts on the frequency. Now, I made a note on the bottom of the screen that all of you can look at that this is a 36 tooth minus two uh, count reluctor, which means it had 36 teeth and they left two missing by factory, which means the missing two is the wide one that's supposed to be there, but the other one is that guy right there. Now, some of you can look at this picture and you should be able to see my cursor. Uh, I know it's relatively small on your screens, but this thing has a missing tooth. And I know someone's gonna say it or think it out there. Well, whoever did that timing belt got aggressive. Uh, I'm gonna have to agree with you. Someone broke the tooth off. But here's another point I wanna make to you. I, 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 look, yes, this one missing tooth is what's causing this thinner gap right here because it's the two missing teeth that was actually designed. The frequency helped me find it. The view of the crankshaft position helped me find it. But I'm gonna tell you guys something and I can't be any clearer about this. I am an incredibly lazy technician. I mean, if I can find a faster, easier, lazier way to get my work done, I will do it. And I'm constantly learning lazier ways to do things, okay? But here's the other thing I've learned over the time. I don't take apart anything. I don't take apart anything on these cars unless I have an idea of what I expect to find inside. For example, I'm going to go back to this picture. We took this vehicle apart expecting to find a missing tooth because, hey, it's a lot of work to take an engine down to this level. And everyone, oh, look, look, I, I'm not trying to be a jerk here. I'm just telling you the truth. Every one of you listening to me right now either has or will take apart something because they thought they knew exactly what was wrong in it. They shred it all over the bench. And then they stand there looking like a goat looking at a watch with all these pieces going, I thought it'd be easier to find. We've all done it. 
dang, guys, every one of you, every one of you can sit there and go, yeah, you know, I had this car in this shop. It had this ticking noise, and I was sure it was a lifter. And so you shred the whole thing, and then you're calling your buddies over, and you're calling the service manager over. And you go, uh, does anyone see the problem? Nope, because it all looks perfect. Well, congratulations. Now you can put the whole freaking thing back together again and reanalyze it. And that's when you, as a technician, realized that you need a stethoscope. You realized you need to put a screwdriver on it. You realized you need to disable cylinders. Every one of you that's been through that, if you have a noise, you analyze and listen and analyze and listen, and you call your buddies over before you take it apart. The same exact thing goes with engine components or trans components or anything that we, with our lab scopes and our modern testing equipments, have the ability to do. I knew... I'd find this well before that timing caver cover came off because of that. All right. Did you guys understand that? Maybe a show of hands. I mean, you're, you're, not a, you're not a normal audience for me out here. I can usually get guys nodding their heads and stuff. But yeah, okay. You guys got it. Perfect. Thanks. You can put your hands down. Okay. Let's, uh, let's go ahead and uh, do a, a few more here. Uh, like I said, guys, I'm going to keep you from a presentation standpoint about another 10 minutes. I know that two hours is quite some time to sit in front of your computer. But once again, I will stick around if there's questions afterward. Uh, uh, make sure you stick around if, if you want to take care of that. So next topic, duty cycles. All right. So uh, look, guys. I showed you earlier that we could build a duty cycle channel to measure the duty cycle. And I showed you a duty cycle uh, in percentage of that mass airflow a little bit earlier. So building a duty cycle math channel is really as easy, if not easier, than a frequency channel. I simply open my advanced tab. I come down. I click on duty. And I simply put in the channel I'm looking for. But there is one complication with duty cycles. And here's what it is. The Pico scope assumes when you build a duty cycle that the percentage of on time is when the voltage is high. Voltage high is on, voltage low is off. So they base their percentage off the time that the signal is high. So the reason I would tell you this is if I build a duty cycle A, it's going to read the percentage of on time based off of high voltage. Let's say, however, I want to build a duty cycle that is considered on when it's at low voltage. When I build my, my math channel, if I simply put a negative marker in front of my channel, it will now assume that when the signal is low, that is when it's on. So here's what I'm getting at. A duty cycle that simply just says A, will consider the percentage high on, uh, excuse me, voltage high on. When it says duty cycle negative A, it's channel A low being the percentage on. And just to show this to you how this would work, I'm going to open up a waveform for you right here. Uh, here is a mass airflow sensor, high speed uh, frequency airflow sensor taken off the 2006 six liter General Motors truck. Here's the actual signal in blue showing you the high voltage, low, high, low, high, low. You can see that. The next channel down in black is my frequency in hertz. You will notice that my frequency in hertz right here is very, very stable at uh, 472 cycles per second. The next one down in green, this channel right here, is percentage. This is percentage. And it is saying, Adam, the percentage of on time is 97 point We'll just round it to 5%, 97.5% on time. But the channel on the bottom is also percentage. But see what I've done is I've used this as a standard A math channel, which measures the on time as when it's the signal's high, which it says 97.5. By the way, very, very stable. I chose my next math channel as negative A, who then decided to say this is the on time. So this channel states the on time high is 97 or 97 and a half percent, while this channel says my on time down here is two and a half percent. If you did the math between these, you'd realize that the duty cycle of the full signal from the on and off times equals 100%. And that could become very, very useful 
when you start diving into variable valve timing and uh, uh, duty cycle and pulse width modulated controls on some of your driven outlets, transmission, whatever it be, I'm sure if you, you, you start letting your imagination flow, there's a lot of places you would need to determine if you want to look at the positive or the negative approach to that from a, a math channel standpoint. All right. Uh, well, I, uh, I couldn't let you go thinking it was all just that simple. So I had to throw kind of a curveball to you. I am not going to explain how I built this math channel, but take a look at this here. I built a math channel that's called 60 times two times frequency of B. Look, the long and short of this, and I got I to be honest, these are frustrating to build. But this was going to allow me to build an RPM frequency for a vehicle. And I'm going to do it off the cam signal. So let's just skip right to this. And let me explain this. Look, I showed you guys earlier. If you were paying attention to me, I showed you earlier, and I truly believe this in my heart, that PicoScope 7 is easier at building a graph for RPM than PicoScope 6. I mean, if you guys think honestly, you're going to run back out to the shop tomorrow, build that and be successful, you're chasing cars and barking at the moon. It ain't going to happen. I sat down with a pen and paper and thought about it and tried it. It was wrong, 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 wrong until I came up with this. But with PicoScope 7, like I showed you earlier, it was literally just a, cl a couple clicks and the wizard took care of it. Okay. Now keep in mind, let's go back to the beginning of class again. Let's say that you have a Pico 6 waveform. All right like this one, here's Pico 6, you want to build an RPM channel, which is right here in green, but you don't know how to build the calculation for it, then open this waveform in PicoScope 7, build, use the crank button, build it, then take that equation and put it into your PicoScope 6. See, I know that may sound a little advanced to you, but I told you there's a reason that you should have both PicoScope 7 and 6 and open your waveform in both so you can share information from one to the other, especially with math channels. I mean, like I told you I was lazy, and that's the first thing I'd try before I tried to build the, the graph again. But anyway, let me show you why I did this. Uh, the picture you're looking at on the screen here is a 2007 Kia Rondo that has a crankshaft position sensor issue, all right? And what would happen is, as you drove this down the road, it would really only do it under load. Uh, when you got up around 3,500 or so RPM or higher, it would have just a quick little stumble, it set a check engine light, it set a crankshaft position sensor code, and then it went into default. Then it had a rev limiter, you couldn't rev it up anymore. This thing had already had, I don't wanna say a small handful of parts installed in it, but it got a small handful of parts installed. Uh, including a few crankshaft position sensors. You guys need to understand something. Just because a part is new doesn't mean it works. New means never ever worked if you think about it. So even just because you replace a part does not mean it fixed, it fixed or wasn't your problem. And you've all been through that. Well, here's a good example of where the new part was faulty. On the screen, I have the camshaft signal in the top on red. I have the crank, excuse me, crankshaft signal in blue right here. I have in green, this is the graph of my RPM going from about, say, I don't know, 1,200 RPM to a peak of about 3,800 or so. But this is my RPM graph. So I have one graph showing me my RPM going from low to high to back down. I have built a frequency math channel. So here we're looking at two. I've got an RPM math channel. I have a frequency math channel, all based off of this crankshaft position sensor. Right now. Everything looks good to me. Now it looks like crap. Now it might take you a minute to figure this out, but one of the advantages of graphing RPM on the screen is when I test drove the vehicle, I go, wow, it just did it. And I was at like 3,000, 3,500 RPM. So I could literally do this, guys. I could literally just use my RPM graph and say, I know it happened about here. So I can zoom into this point. And here's what I see. I see that my frequency of my crankshaft sensor went up, 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 and then it kind of went down. And it's got these huge dropouts. Well, guys, you should know this by now. The huge dropouts are here. Why? The huge dropouts in frequency are happening because there's a number one sink, sink, sink. 
sync. Now let's go back to this. So here's what I see. Sync, 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 sync. Okay, it gets faster, 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 faster. And then look right here. Right here at this point on your screen, look at this. I have my natural sync. I have my natural sync and a drop in frequency right in the middle of them, right there. Let's zoom in on that and take a look. Here's my crankshaft sensor. Here's my normal sync. Here's my normal sync again. And here is my extra little dropout that's not supposed to be there that literally, guys, think about this. Think about this. That little tiny dropout, that drop in frequency right there was 363 microseconds long. Microseconds. Think about this. There's 1,000 milliseconds in a second. There's 1,000 microseconds in one millisecond. That means this little tiny event at exactly 3,808 RPM right here, that little event is an event that could happen approximately 3,000 times in one second of time. And you are not going to find other types of diagnostic equipment other than lab scopes themselves that are going to be able to find a problem like that. And it was, guys, another bad crankshaft position sensor. But I just really want to take the opportunity to show you how we can mix some of those math channels together. And, uh, well, uh, that brings us uh, to the two-hour mark. Um, I, am, I am complete with my presentation. Uh, we didn't have a chance to get to reference waveforms. I figured this might happen. It certainly happened uh, again on Monday night. But I'd like to take the opportunity to uh, uh, talk to Todd and Cliff and Randy. Um, you know, if you guys can uh, undo your mics here, uh, if you guys have anything you want to comment on, are there any questions we need to answer? Uh, guys that are out there, oh, thanks. Uh, you guys that are out there, if you have questions at this point, you're more than welcome to uh, uh, throw them in Q&A if you could, because chat can get kind of busy. Um, if you end up having questions that you don't want to cover tonight, uh, remember when you get your thank you email uh, from Randy. Um, when you get your thank you email from Randy, he will uh, uh, have a contact email in there and we can discuss your questions and make sure you, you get an answer on that. So Adam, there was uh, one with Eric had a question that originally kind of was discussing about measuring frequency on an analog mass airflow sensor yep. and realizing that on a true analog, there wouldn't be any frequency but then again, if you think about it uh, in another light, you actually have the chance to look at an analog uh, mass airflow for dropouts if you're actually using the math channel. So uh, that was a discussion and a question that came up that we went back and forth, but I think that was something that you did cover, but it was something that uh, uh, I think a lot of people like wheel speed sensors and dude, you know anything that... Th think about what you just said, Todd. This is so cool because, because you brought up analog mass airflow. What's the difference between a man, uh, an analog mass airflow or a throttle position sensor or an accelerator pedal position or any type of potentiometer, anything that has an analog? You bet. You could put that over an incredible period of time and use a math channel to look for dropouts or drop-ups. Remember, we can dro have drop-ups also. Yep. It's an incredible tool. That was a fantastic point. And you said that was Eric that uh, was talking about that. That's, that's awesome, guys. Correct. I love it. Yep. Love it. Yeah. Love it. Okay. Well, Adam, it's been a great night. It looks like our attendees are about to wrap up here on us. And, uh, but uh, thank you for doing such an outstanding job. And thanks to all our panelists tonight for participating. Don't forget that we'll be back on Friday, one o'clock Eastern time. And in the future, if you're looking for more virtual classroom events, go to CTI online, search training and virtual classroom, and you'll find, uh, you'll find links to not only future webinars, but also pre-recorded videos of uh, past webinars too, so you can search that out there. Also, there'll be a link uh, to go to our CTI and WTI members Facebook page in that follow-up email also, so you can uh, jump on that and request access to that pa Facebook page. Guys, thanks very much. Uh, hope everybody stays safe. Stay tuned.